everyone. Thanks for joining us for the first show of the new year here at Smithsonian Science How. We're so happy to have you with us. Joining us today is Smithsonian entomologist, Dr. Hannah Wood. Hannah, thank you so much for being here yep, with us. Happy to be here. Hannah, you're an entomologist who studies spiders, mm -hmm. which is a type of biologist. Yep. Did you always know that you were going to be a biologist? No, I didn't. I, I actually found science rather boring and dry. Well, that was my conception of it. And I studied English literature as an undergrad, and I was studying dance. I always considered myself a bit more artistic. And it was only later that I started looking at how art had affected literature and the arts, how, sorry, how science had affected literature and the arts, that I really got an interested in science, and it started to become a career for me. So did you find the art in science? I did, and um, in many different ways, I found that it's actually quite creative. Um, just from when you describe a species and you're taking images, these beautiful images, and you're making drawings, to when you go out into the field and you see patterns in the world around you, and then you have to come up with a creative hypothesis to try and describe these patterns that you see. And I mean, it's clearly very beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really interesting that you started as English literature and really mm -hmm. interested in the arts to studying spiders. A lot yep. of people think spiders are scary. And I mean, I know. even their bigger family, the arachnids, do they get yep. a bad rap? They get a really bad rap. And it's usually because of the media and popular culture really overblows how scary these creatures are. There are some a few representatives that can be dangerous, but not really. Um, so arachnids contain, there's a huge diversity of arachnids. The vast, vast majority of them are not dangerous, and these are things like harvestmen, amblypigids, scorpions, vinegaroons, all kinds of things, as well as spiders. So what was it about spiders that inspired you to study them? Oh, well, they're just these, I mean, I think they're these very beautiful creatures. They're so diverse, and they have such an amazing amount of diversity in their behaviors, their shapes, um, how they eat, how they mate, um, and I was just fascinated. They were so different from how humans are. I think that was part of the fascination. Well, we saw, see in some of these pictures here, they certainly are diverse, and mm -hmm. to me, I think they're beautiful as well. Yep. So I wonder what makes a spider a spider? Do you think we should ask our viewers? Yep, let's ask them. Students, here's a chance to participate in a live poll with us. You can respond using the window that appears to the right of your video screen. Tell us, what makes a spider a spider? Spiders have fangs that inject venom, are dangerous to humans, can spin silk fibers, and know how to build webs. Take a moment to think about it, and again, put your response in the window that appears to the right of your video. Hannah, it's interesting. We're looking at the results coming in yep. together, and they're all split between the last two answers, can spin silk fibers and know how to build webs. How did they do? They did, I'd say they did pretty good. Um, first of all, let's start at the beginning with have fangs that can inject venom. This is something that the vast majority, so all spiders have fangs, um, and the majority of them can inject venom. But again, don't be worried. The vast majority, are, it's not dangerous to humans. So this, that is, the, the first answer is a trait that all spiders have. So what about the spinning silk? Um, all spiders can spin silk, so that is also correct. Um, however, not all spiders know how to build webs. Um, spiders use, they spin so silk. So here's a image of what? Yes, this is a image, a scan, a, an electron microscope image of the spinnerets. These are, and at the tips of each spinneret, you can see the little spigots, and the, each spigot produces a strand of silk. Um, and so all spiders have this capability. They can produce silk. Some of them, they can use it for laying drag lines, for wrapping their egg cases, but it's only a proportion of spiders that use it to build webs. Um, and so not all spiders build webs to capture prey. 
So how are they capturing their prey if they're not building a web? If a spider isn't building a web to capture prey, they're an active hunter. So they go out into the forest at night and they're actively um, capture, hunting their prey down, stalking them and capturing them. Like we're seeing in this image here? Mm -hmm. Yep, they use their, la their legs and their mouth parts to capture them. This image we see is of a, a spider that's mimicking an ant and then it lives with the ants and fools the ants into thinking it's another ant, but it actually preys on them. Oh, wow, that's fascinating. And mm -hmm. here too? And here we have another spider that has just captured a fly that it was hunting as it was walking around on, on vegetation. So you mentioned that there's a huge diversity of spiders. Mm -hmm. What about the spiders that you study? You can't possibly study them all. <laughs> no, there so, there's over 46,000 species of spiders. Wow. I work on a very small um, proportion of that on a super family called the Palpamanoidea. Palpamanoidea? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's a mouthful. A, yeah, it's quite a long name. We can also call them assassin spiders, makes it a little bit easier. But this is a super family. A super family just means a cluster, a, a close, closely related group of families. And so I work on five families that belong to assassin spiders. So can you give us an example of one of them? Is this one of them here? Mm -hmm. This is a pelican spider, family Archaeidae. And um, yes, there are five different families of assassin spiders, and this is one of them and they capture their prey, they have this unusual way of capturing their prey as you- That was pretty incredible. Yep, <laughs> where they, they're attacking their prey at a distance. They, um, you can see right here, they're, so palpamanoids target other spiders. They seem, they have an affinity towards this and they have these unusual modifications, this family in particular, where it holds its, its spider prey out at a distance away from its body. And then does it eat it with mm -hmm. those same jaws? Yes, um, so it's only, it, it holds the prey at a distance and it's only after the, the prey has stopped moving that it then begins to feed on the prey. Wow, how interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, how big is that spider? It was a little bit scary the way it attacked. It's very small, that, that pelican spider is, you can see it right here. They, they range in size from about, they're about the size of a grain of rice. Interesting. So thanks for giving us a little bit of an overview about spiders mm -hmm. and some of the spiders that you study. So let's learn a little bit more about um, these assassin spiders that you um, study. Mm -hmm. Can you give us an overview of what their body shapes are like? Yeah, so these, um, the assassin spiders, there's a diversity of shapes among the, the just the, the, mainly the frontal region of these spiders. And within the, the assassin spiders, you have some with highly modified, this highly modified frontal region. And what's that frontal region called? It's called the carapace. Um, and it's, you, you can see it here in this picture. In some of the assassin spiders, it sits as a flat plate. Whereas in others, like the, the pelican spider, it's this highly modified form where it looks like a pelican almost, a bird where it has a head and a neck. Um, and then in other members, like the, the Mechis malconeids or the trap jaw spiders seen here, it has this, um, again, a, a modified shape, but it still is a little bit different than the pelican spider or the other ones. What inspired you to study this group? I mean, they're very interesting, they look very cool, but I mean, was there a reason that you decided to jump into these assassin spiders? Well, I didn't, I knew that I wanted to study entomology or arthropods. I loved arthropods, things with exoskeletons, but I got a job working at a natural history museum, uh, California Academy of Sciences for the summer, and they had a big project going on in Madagascar. And I was young, I loved traveling, and I really wanted to go to Madagascar. And so I started working on spiders initially because I just wanted to go to Madagascar. And, um, but then I fell in love with the group, the palpamanoids, the assassin spiders, and it turned into a PhD project and it, into my career now. It's so fascinating. And mm -hmm. I mean, we just saw those images of the different body shapes. Yep. I mean, there's so much diversity even within that group that you're studying. Mm -hmm. I think we should ask our students again, based a little bit on what they've seen, why they think that there is that diversity of body shapes. What do you think? Yep. Viewers, here's another opportunity to participate in a live poll. Tell us why these assassin spiders have weird head shapes. Are they for burrowing underground, protection from predators, feeding on certain foods, or attracting meat? Take a moment to think about it and put your answer in the window that appears to the right of the video.
Hannah, the results are coming in and there's a smattering across all the responses, but most people think that the weird body shapes are for feeding on certain foods. Mm -hmm. What's the correct answer? I'd say that's the, the best answer out of all of those. It does seem that this unusual modification to the carapace has allowed these spiders to have highly maneuverable chelicery, which you can think of as jaws, um, functionally equivalent to jaws. And so that shape does relate directly to how they capture their prey. So where did you first notice these spiders? I first started working on these spiders in museum collections. Um, and so it was only later that I went into the field to observe them alive. But I originally got started working on this group just studying museum specimens. So where are their living spiders that you study? And did you go get them? Are these the, the palpa man, the assassin the spiders? Assassin spider? These yeah. occur in the southern hemisphere mostly. Um, and so the, the, the assassin spiders you can find throughout the southern hemisphere. However, um, what you see in this image, the, the trap jaw spiders really occur only in New Zealand and Chile. So that's one family of spiders. And so did you go there to collect them? Yes, I did. Um, I went down there because I'd observed these unusual shapes and I wanted to know what, why these spiders looked this way. And so I went down first to Chile to observe the trap jaw spiders to see why they looked the way that they did. So how do you capture them in the wild? Well, trap jaw spiders are very small. Um, they're, here's some right here, which is just, they're these little tiny specks in these vials. They're about the size of half a grain of rice to a grain of rice. And they're so, they're cryptic. They live in the forest leaf litter. And we have to literally extract them from the forest because you don't see them one, walking around at night. And so what we do is we use this tool called a litter sifter. So this right here. Mm -hmm. And in that there's a wire mesh and there's a bag at the bottom that collects. So you put litter in forest litter that you scoop up off the ground, then you shake it. And then all the concentrated leaf litter falls onto the ground. And then you can spread that concentrated leaf litter out onto this sheet that we see here in this picture. And, and what's that in your mouth? Oh, so <laughs> that is a, an, it's called an aspirator or a pooter. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's, it's a way that you actually suck up the spiders. So only small spiders that are about, <laughs> that will fit in there. But you, it has a filter in the bottom. So you're, you don't actually suck them up, but you, and then they get stuck here and then you blow them out into the collection tube. Have you ever sucked up a spider inadvertently? <laughs> I haven't ever sucked up a spider to my knowledge, but I think one time I sucked up a centipede because I was getting it and then I felt something hit my throat and it was no longer in there, but I'm not quite sure. Well, <laughs> very I, small centipede. <laughs> I was going to say, at least we know that it was very small because this is in a very large instrument. Yes. So what happens once you collect the spiders? You said you put them into a vial. Do you keep them alive? Do you look at their behavior? Yes, I, so um, I, for the trap jaw spiders, I keep them alive in a vial like this and um, in a box like this and you can put them in these little tiny containers because these spiders are so small that they'll fit in here um, with plenty of room with some moist cotton in it and store them into, into this box and keep them so that I can observe their behaviors. And what kind of behaviors did you observe? Anything dealing with a trap jaw? Because we know that that's their name. Yeah, so when I first went to Chile, they weren't called trap jaw spiders. We didn't know what their behaviors were. They hadn't been observed before in the wild. And um, I started watching them. And what I saw is that they use their, their jaws or their chelicery in this really unusual way where they hold them greatly extended away from their body out and open. and they have them set in place with these long hairs that project forward so that when um, the prey stimulates those hairs, those, the jaws snap closed very quickly. You can think of it as a, as a bear trap. Here we'll see a video. You'll see the, the spider holds those chelicery open. That happened very quick, so you couldn't really see it, but uh, then <laughs> it, it caught the, the prey. I think we have an animation here that describes how they, um, how they close. Yes. So, we're looking yeah, here at we that go. Here. Here's a little hopping insect, and um, the the trap jaw spider. You'll see here those jaws. When they detect the prey, they hold those jaws open, and they just hold them open, waiting until the prey causes them to snap. They then snap their jaws closed around the prey. 
So for such a small animal, is that speed significant for how fast they're closing that? Well, that's what I wanted to see. So these spiders, they have this, um, different species have, some have a really wide gape. They can hold their jaws open really wide. Some it's not as wide. I, and I wanted to know, you know, how, what's going on? Are they, do they have really fast closing jaws? And so I started recording them with a high speed camera. And um, here you see a, a shot taken at 3000 frames a second. And you could see those, those jaws were held open and that what they were snapping around was actually an eyelash, that, that line in there. That's how small they are. They're teeny. But that, that species you saw was closing its jaws extremely rapidly. And I mean, what's a comparison for this rapid closure? Is there any? Well, they, um, a comparison, I mean, it's extremely fast. It's a movement that's much faster than what we think of when we think of as fast, like a hummingbird wing beating. This is extremely faster than that. And um, some of these species, they have, they can go from zero to 12 meters per second, and they have remarkable acceleration. So they, um, they, they're going, they're achieving these high speeds, but they're doing it in an extremely short amount of time. Um, so some species can, will close their jaws in 0 0.0005 of a second, which is extremely, extremely rapid. So what kind of prey are they eating that they need this rapid closure of their jaws? Well, that's what we don't know yet. Um, again, these spiders are so cryptic that it's, it's hard to really observe them in the wild and test. There's only five observations in the wild, um, and these are of the larger, slower trap jaw spider species, and they were found with other spiders in their jaws. And this makes sense because these are palpamenoids. They're assassin spiders and they have this, you know, that, that whole super family has an affinity towards preying on other spiders. However, it's a little bit more complicated because the smallest species, which also have the fastest jaws, don't, we, we don't know anything about them, but um, about their predatory behaviors, except what we observe in the lab where they will only eat um, columbula or uh, these commonly called springtails. So prey that have a rapid escape jump. Here you can, you can see one here. So they also have a rapid <laughs> a power process. Yeah, so it may seem that these really fast ones are specialized on preying on really fast prey. So what's unique about this fast closure? Is there other animal, are there other animals in the animal kingdom that do this? Yeah, so what this, these spiders are moving their jaws so fast that there, there has to be a mechanism that they evolved to store, that surpasses the, the constraint of what a muscle can do. So they evolved a mechanism to store energy into a system and then release it instantaneously. Kind of like how a, um, how you would set a bow and arrow, right? You would put energy into it and then release it and it, the the arrow flings forward. And so there, there are many other animals that have evolved this. It's called power amplification, and particularly among the arthropods, which are organisms with an exoskeleton of which spiders and insects and arachnids belong. Um, but they're, they, they're small, arthropods tend to be small, and they've evolved these ways to move quickly. And so some examples might be a trap jaw ant, which it's quite remarkable, the convergence between the trap jaw ants and the, the trap jaw spiders. You also have the mantis shrimp that has an extremely powerful, fast strike that occurs underwater. There's uh, these termite soldiers that have rapid strikes of this one species. And then just the jump of a flea. When you see a flea jump so high, they're using power amplification. So to better understand this power amplification and this in the spiders that you're studying, what mm -hmm. kind of tools are you using? I mean, at a size of half a grain of rice, I mean, I think you need more than a microscope. Yes, these spiders are so tiny that it makes it difficult to dissect, but luckily we can digitalize dissect them using a really strong x-ray beam. So kind of how a human will go in for an MRI, we can do the same thing with a spider using a, a beam line at a, at a particle accelerator where you produce a really strong beam and this allows you to make these 3D computer models, like what we see in this video, where um, you can see these very, very tiny structures uh, that you can zoom into um, that would be difficult otherwise to observe. And here we can see the different parts of the, the jaws and the muscle attachments that attach to them. And again, this tool allows us to almost digitally dissect these these very small organisms. And I see a model here on the table. Does that tool allow you to make these models? Yes, so then using, using these scans, you can take these, you can print them out using a 3D printer. And that's what we've done here. This is the same, um, 
the same, this is printed from that video that we just saw. So it's the same species. And then what I did is I drilled little holes to where the, and put strings in for where the muscle attachments are and put these elastic strings for where I think energy is being stored to produce these fast um, speeds. And this just gives me a way to, I could sort of in, in a larger size, manually manipulate this, these structures and see, come up with a hypothesis for how I thought these high speeds were being achieved. Oh, it's really fascinating how you're mm -hmm. really using engineering practices mm -hmm. and imaging to better understand yes. this spider's behavior. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a lot of student questions coming in. Let's try to get to some of them right now. Okay. This question comes from Banner Academy from Connor. How many species of spiders are there in the world? Great question, Connor. Um, so right now there are over 46,000 species of spiders that have been described. However, arachnologists estimate that this is at most maybe 50% of the diversity that's out there. So we're still describing species all the time and there's a lot more to, there's gonna end up, there'll be a lot more of a final total diversity in the end. So this one is coming from Brazos Bend Academy. How many eggs can a trap jaw spider lay at one time? That's a great question. Um, so trap jaw spiders, what I've observed in the field is they typically have egg cases that contain anywhere from five to nine eggs. <laughs> now, we have another question, but this one comes in by video, so let's have okay. a look. Hi, my name's Austin. What are you expecting to find about the mechanism of the jaw closing? Hi, Austin, that's a good question. And so we don't really know. We're still discovering that and, and trying to see, but I, I suspect that maybe um, uh, hydrostatic pressure may be involved in the mechanism, which would make it quite interesting because this pressure will somehow relate to the high speeds. So Mrs. Morin's fifth grade class wants to know if you have any spiders as pets. Well, I used to have a lot of spiders as pets. Um, however, I recently moved out here to Washington, <laughs> D.C., and just over the years, they've all, I haven't gotten any new ones and they've slowly died off. So right now I don't have any, but I hope to have a lot more soon. <laughs> <laughs> this question is from Ross Elementary School, who's actually joining us here at the Smithsonian viewing your show today. Okay. And they would like to know, do all spiders eat the same way? Do all spiders or the spiders that I work on, well, spiders have a variety of techniques as how they, they capture prey. Um, I'd say eating wise, they do tend to, they suck, they suck up the juices that were digested, but how they actually got the prey there before they digest it, there's a variety of ways that they can do this. Okay, this one comes from Avani. Isn't that the same way the Venus flytrap works? Talking about the trap jaw spider. That's a great question. Um, it is similar in that these plants will hold, you know, hold the, the structures open until the fly lands in and then they slowly close. The difference is, is that these spiders are, are moving their jaws much, much, much more rapidly than what the, the plant will do when it closes. But it is a similar technique. From Hughes Learning Academy, how many spiders do you know of that have gone extinct? Well, so that's an interesting question. There are spiders that existed before humans had even evolved. You know, there are fossil spiders, many of which that have, that, that have gone extinct, not caused by humans. Um, extinction that was caused by humans, I'd say we don't really know. You know, there's so much we don't know about spiders and some species that live in such a small area that if you wipe out that whole area, that spider is very likely gone. So there have to be lots, but we probably don't know, haven't discovered them yet. Chandler Homeschool, how do spiders get their venom? Well, they, they produce their venom in their body. They have venom glands that, um, that occur close in, in that frontal region of the spider, and that's where they produce their venom. And then it runs through the, the chelicery or jaws and out the fang, a little, t a little hole at the tip of the fangs. So Jacob asks, how fast does it take a trap jaw spider to eat its prey? We know it can catch it quickly. What That's a eating? good question. So they capture it quickly and then they, I would say they hold it in their close to their mouth parts for maybe an hour, hour, two hours. They hold it there for a long time and suck up all the juices. <laughs> Ashton would like to know if the trap jaws are dangerous to humans. No, they're not dangerous to humans at all. They're so small and um, they, they don't occur anywhere that humans occur. They're incredibly difficult to find. You have to use special techniques to get them. So to even 
happen upon one is almost impossible unless you're an active, actively searching for them. So a more general question about spider spiders. Jordan and Manal ask, where is the most venomous spider located? Well, so it's, if, to be a dangerous spider, you really need two things. You need to have venom that's gonna be toxic to humans and you also need to be an aggressive spider. So there are spiders that are, that may be dangerous, but they're, it's very difficult to get them to bite you. And I would say the, the most dangerous spiders, the Sydney funnel web that occurs in Australia, it's extremely aggressive and it also has toxic venom. And then there are some in South America. But again, this is a very, very small handful of the total diversity of spiders that are out there. Sophia and Porter from Canyon Ridge ask how long spiders have been around? Millions and hundreds of millions of years since the Devonian, um, maybe even further back, at least I'd say 400, 450 million years ago. Do we have fossil evidence of spiders? Yes, so this is based on fossils that we, of, of spiders and arachnids that we, we know this. Uh, Mia asks, what preys on spiders? Uh, lots of things prey on spiders. Now, if you're living in the leaf litter, think you maybe a centipede will prey on you versus if you're an, building a orb web outside and maybe a bird will prey on you. So it depends where you live, but there are a variety of things that prey on spiders. And this one comes from Brazos Bend Academy. When you scan these spiders, does the spider survive? Unfortunately, they don't. Although I've never tested scanning them with a live spider, but um, you possibly could. You need the, the specimen to hold still. To, so it needs to be a dead specimen in order to scan it because they have to be very, very still for an about an hour. So this is our last question. Thank you for sending so many great ones in. This one comes in from Becca. At what age did you realize that you wanted to study spiders? It wasn't until my mid 20s when I wanted to go when I decided I wanted to go to Madagascar so I didn't know until then I had a lot of career changes along the way <laughs> and you're here today studying and discovering new things about mm -hmm. spiders every day yep Hannah thank you so much for being here with us helping us better understand spiders and the work that you're doing on them what can our viewers do if they're interested in learning more about spiders or entomology in general yeah so I would say the best thing to do is go outside to your own backyard and start observing spiders. You can keep some alive um, and just watching their behaviors, visiting natural history museums and talking to the researchers there. Um, there are many opportunities to volunteer and work at natural history museums. I would say that's the best way to start getting involved. Wonderful. Thank you so much for being here today, Hannah. Yep, happy to be here. And thank you so much for tuning in and asking so many wonderful questions. If you missed part of this broadcast or want to view it again, it'll be archived later this evening at curious.si.edu. We hope to see you next time on Smithsonian Science House. Thanks so much.